Sí. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts, the 14th chapter of that book. the eighth verse of that chapter. And we'll be reading through verse 21. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. The Bible says, <clears throat> and at Lystra there was sitting a certain man without strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. And when the multitude saw what Paul had done, <clears throat> they raised their voice saying in the Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. And we preach the gospel to you in order that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in the <clears throat> generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet, he did not leave himself without a witness, without witness, in that he did good and gave rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even saying these things, they with difficulty restrained the crowd from offering sacrifices to them. But Jews came from Antioch and, and Iconium, and having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But when the, the disciples stood over him, around him, he arose and entered the city, and the next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word today. As we turn to Holy Scripture, we, we ask that you would illuminate us. We need to understand what you're saying in this scripture. Teach us, we pray. Create in us obedience, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I have a little bit of a sinus problem today, so pray that I make it through the message. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, on the weekend of Seth and McKaylee's wedding, I had an opportunity to catch up with Hannah Perkins and her recent trip to Greece. This was a school trip that the basketball team took, and she got to go to one of she got to go on this trip because she was one of the team trainers. It was fascinating talking to her about her trip as she went through some of the biblical cities that they had passed or stopped at, she recounted to me some of the thoughts she had tracing the steps of the biblical stories. One of the questions she asked me that evening was whether the Greeks 
of the biblical era thought that their gods, like Zeus, Hermes, Diane, and so on, actually walked among men. The reason for this was that her tour guides were talking like the stories about these gods were actually legitimate historical occurrences. She wondered if, 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 they, were, if they were aware of the fact that, that these were just made up fictional accounts. Did they, did they really believe that these so-called gods walked the earth? And we had an interesting discussion that evening on their perspective on their gods and our perspective on ours. It's clear from the history of the world that some people believed that these accounts of these gods were real. Some, some of them clung to these accounts, while others abandoned them as simply made-up stories. Whatever the case, it was going to eventually be a, a conflict and contrast between Christianity and the gods of the Greeks. Remember what's going on in the book of Acts. The gospel is going further and further into Gentile territory. What did Gentiles do? They worshiped false gods. So there was going to come a time eventually when there was a conflict between the gods of the people and the gods, the God of Christianity. This morning we come to just one of those opening accounts. Here in this next story, we see a conflict between the God of the Bible and the God of the world, gods of the world. When these conflicts happen, there is a temptation for compromise through synchronization. Let me, let, let me talk about this for just a moment. When you hear the idea of synchro, syncretization, what do you think of, other than the fact that you can't spell it? When we think of synchronization, we, we think of Christianity fusing itself with other religions, mixing with them, and through the mixture, confounding Christianity. But, but why does religious synchronization take place? Sometimes it's because of conflict. A person doesn't want to be noticeably different and therefore accept, susceptible to, to persecution and ill treatment. So they syncretize, they, they synchronize, they sync with other groups or with other thoughts so that they don't look to be out of step with other people. So sometimes synchronization is a result of trying to watch your back. That's the negative side of synchronization. Sometimes it's not a matter of wanting to hide, but a matter of wanting to be embraced. The more Christianity looks like what people are already comfortable with, the easier some people think it will be for them to embrace it. This morning we come to a story that holds both of these temptations. The temptation for safety and the temptation for acceptance. Let me say it again. This story holds the temptation for safety and the temptation for acceptance. As I thought about this story, I couldn't, I couldn't help but think about us. Have you ever faced these type of temptations? The temptation for safety and acceptance? Have you ever been tempted on the job or in class to to not add a distinctively Christian viewpoint to a conversation because you're concerned about negative backlash? What are you concerned about there? Safety. Safety. Have you ever curbed your viewpoint on the fly in the midst of interacting with unsaved friends because you wanted to be embraced positively by them? What's that? Acceptance. You see, if, if we'd be honest this morning, each of us can easily be tempted with safety and acceptance. We don't, we don't want to be the oddball. We want to be the one that sticks out. We want to be embraced by others, accepted by the group. Here in this story of the ministry of 
Paul and Barnabas in Lystra and Derby, we get some idea of how Christians should respond to these things. Paul and Barnabas <coughs> will, allow, <coughs> will, will allow neither of these temptations to alter their viewpoint on the gospel and the Christian faith. Let's pick up this story, verses 8 through 20, really 8 through 21, in Paul's ministry in Lystria and Derby. There were three place names mentioned at the end of their ministry in I. I Honium, which they fled from. And that's chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. The first place was Lyconia. Lyconia was a district in the Roman province of Galatia. Again, keep in mind that Paul wrote his first letter in the Bible to this region. The two cities that were mentioned here were Lystria and Derby. Lystria was about 18 miles from I. Conium and Derby was approximately 40 miles from Lystria. This could be referred to as Southern Galatia. Southern Galatia. Those of you who've been reading ahead of, of me or are familiar with the storyline of the book of Acts, you know that something very important happens in Lystria. What happens in Lystria? Later in the book of Acts, Paul is going to draft his most important ministry assistant from this very city. His name was Timothy. Timothy was from Lystria, and Timothy was saved, and his, and his mother and his grandmother, under the gospel presentation of the Apostle Paul here in the city of Lystria. So it's a very important city, New Testament-wise, for that is the place that Timothy comes from. We begin with Lystria, and this will take us through to chapter, verse, verse 20. In Acts 14, verses 8 through 20, there are four scenes here in the city of Lystria. The first scene focused on the healing of the lame man. That's verses 8 through 10. This was followed by the reaction of the people, verses 11 through 13. The re reaction wasn't good. And that led to the response by the missionaries. That's verses 14 through 18. And then we have really a rather odd story in verses 19 and 20. We have the interjection of the Jews from other cities into what was going on in Lystria and trying to bring to a stop the sharing of the gospel. So let's look at these four scenes here in Lystria. The first scene was the healing of the lame man. The healing of the lame man. Now, uh, we're used to Peter and his and his miracle ministry, but Paul has not been, up to this point, doing a lot of miracles. <clears throat> this is the first time in a story that we see Paul doing a miracle as a prelude to ministry. Look at verses 8 through 10 of this chapter. And at Lystria there was sitting a certain man without strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. This city of Lystria was founded by Caesar Augustus himself about a, a decade before the birth of Jesus Christ. It, along with Antioch in this region, was designated as a, a Roman colony by, by Augustus. Therefore, there was a road, an, an imperial road, that connected these two cities. So travel was very easy. And so Paul and Barnabas show up in town, and they begin preaching the gospel. A man, lame, the Bible says, was listening. Notice the man's physical state. Uh, when, when I read this text, I couldn't help but think of Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and, and John are going up to the temple and, and they come across a, a man who's been lame like this man from his, from his mother's womb. But notice in this text, his lameness is even emphasized more than in chapter 3. Here, Luke tells us that he was, with, was without strength in his feet. And then he adds to that that he had never walked before. In other words, 
this was a genetic issue. Not, it wasn't a sickness. It wasn't an injury. This man was genetically incapable of walking. There was something wrong with his systems. When one cannot say that this healing was false or that the person got better naturally because he was unable to get better from his mother's womb. He had never walked the man's physical condition. Next, notice his spiritual state, verses nine, verse nine. Notice how attentive he was. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well. Here this man was following along with Paul and his preaching. And apparently he was responsive in some noticeable manner. We see this from the fact that when the apostle fixed his gaze on him, it became clear to Paul that the man was believing what he was hearing. Again, I couldn't help but think of Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, the same word was used when, 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 Paul, when uh, Peter and John fixed their gaze on the man. Here, Paul is fixing his gaze on this man. In Acts chapter 3, they fixed their gaze on him, and he thought he was going to get paid, didn't he? He was begging at the temple gate and thought he would receive money from Peter and John. This man, however, notice, he wasn't looking for money. He was exercising faith. In this, in this story, faith takes the prominent role in what will be the man's healing. We ought to realize something very important here, church, when comparing these stories, that while faith oftentimes leads to healing, it's not a prerequisite for healing. Now, why do I bring it up? Well, some faith healers today say that if somebody doesn't get, if somebody doesn't get healed by their ministry, it was their lack of faith. But sometimes God heals in spite of there being no faith. Now, we don't want to we don't want to be faithless. Obviously, we're Christians. We want to have faith. But let's not limit God to your faith. <laughs> he can do beyond what you can even imagine he can do. We've got to be careful with people today. They spread errors. They make Christians feel bad because they're told that they're not healed because of their lack of faith. That is a wolf. That is a wolf indeed. So I want you to notice the difference between the healing here. Again, both lame, both lame from the womb. One was expecting money. The other was exercising faith. And God decided to heal both of them. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. On top of this, on top of this, I have a question from this text. What was the man's faith in? Well, I don't know if you thought about that. Some people argue that he had faith to be healed. Really? Hmm. Where did that expectation come from? Some people speculate, well, maybe, maybe Paul was preaching on Jesus' healing ministry. Well, I guess it's possible. It's possible. I don't see that. In the, in the text. In fact, why would I think Paul was preaching any different than what he preached in Acts 13? He's presenting the gospel. He's preaching the gospel. Now, does the gospel include the healing ministry of Jesus? Sometimes. Sometimes it does. We saw that in Acts chapter 10. But we don't have that here. So what was this man believing in? I believe what he was believing in was the gospel. Paul Paul was preaching the gospel. The man was intense. He was listening. He was agreeing. He was identifying with what Paul was saying. And, 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 and no better person to heal than somebody already exercising faith. He's embracing the gospel, embracing the truth, his spiritual condition. And look in verse 10 at the man's, the man's healing. Verse 10. Luke said that Paul said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up <laughs> and began to walk. There was, 
there was no formulaic process. He wasn't hit on the head. There was no holy oil that had to be sprinkled on him. In fact, remember in Acts 3, Peter actually reached down and grabbed the man and pulled. Paul didn't even do that. He didn't, he didn't reach down. Paul just simply declared, get up. And the man got up on his feet. Now, remember what, what, what Luke has just said. Where was his weakness? In his feet. In his feet. And Paul told him to do, to do what? To stand upright on your feet. And he didn't just get up nice and slow. <laughs> he leaped. He leaped. He leaped. I tell you what, I have to be honest this morning and share with you all. As I read through many of these stories when my wife was struggling with her illness, I, I, I asked God to do this for my wife. Now, God chose not to do that. But anybody who's been sick identifies with this man. He leaped up. He leaped up. And, and Paul didn't say start walking, but what did he start doing? He started walking. Now, Luke had already told us he'd never walked before. So how did he even know how to walk? Right? you got to have a little bit. I mean, babies learn how to walk, and, it, and it, it's not pretty. This guy was striding. You know what? I, I, this reminded me of our earlier studies from the Gospel of Mark where we studied the, healings, the healing ministry of Jesus. And what, what did we notice back then when we studied it? Jesus, when he healed, didn't just take care of the immediate problem. He took care of the, of the overflow from the problem. Let me kind of remind you. In his first miracle in the book of Mark, uh, well, not the first miracle, but one of the first miracles, he goes to Peter's house. Peter's, mom, uh, Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever, uh, and Jesus goes in, touches her, and heals her. But Jonah's healer, what does she do? She gets up and starts serving. Now, when I have a fever, and I've been down for a while, if, when I get better, it's a slow process. <laughs> I got to ramp up again. It's slow. This lady was not only cured of the fever, she was infused with power and energy as well. This man, not only is his feet strengthened where he can finally stand up, but he's in fact walking as well. Sounds a lot like Acts chapter 3. Now in Acts chapter 3, the thousands of people who came up to worship on, on that day at, at the temple that drew their attention and they went and they, and they, and they heard a sermon from Peter. What, what happens here? Not quite as good a process. Look at the reaction of the people, verses 11 through 13. And when the multitudes saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in the, now here's the key, Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. This, this is not turning out good. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. Wow. Now, before we, before we jump into this response, I want to give you some historical background here to this particular region. First off, Zeus worship was, was massive in this region of, of the world. Uh, we've, we've discovered several archaeological finds that, that talk about Z the temple to Zeus. I mean, this, Zeus worship was a major issue here in this, in this, part of the, of this part of the world. Also, the Roman poet Ovid, in one of his massive tomes, records 250 myths, and one of those myths takes place in the hill country of Lyconia. Let me explain what goes on in this particular myth. In this myth, Jupiter, who is the Latin equivalent of Zeus, and Mercury, who is the Latin equivalent of Hermes, take on human form, 
and visited the people in this region. As they were looking for a place for them to lodge, every person to whom they turned rejected them, except for a poor elderly couple. The myth talks of the humble kindness extended to the disguised gods and how the gods then bless them by answering their greatest wish. The rest of the, the area, however, was judged, was, 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 was killed because of their thoughtlessness and their unwillingness to extend hospitality to these disguised gods, these gods that showed up in human form. Now, at first, when you're reading this story and, and they do the miracle and they go immediately to God, you're wondering, that's a jump. Why would they go immediately? But then when you understand their background, it makes sense. They went immediately to the established myth in this, in this particular area. Let me, let me break this down for you. Let's, let's, look at, let's look at their response. First off, verses 11 and 12, their false declaration. We get some clue that, le that leads us to the historical background of this myth immediately. Notice in your text, the inhabitants who were listening and observing began speaking in the regional dialect in the Lyconian language. Paul and Barnabas would have been speaking Greek. Greek was the language of, of, of commerce and civil interaction. So they would have, speaking, they, they would have been speaking Greek. So Paul and Barnabas doing their thing, preaching the gospel in the Greek language, all of a sudden they do this miracle and all, everybody in the audience switches from Greek to their own native language, the Lyconian language. It's clear that these natives were very excited over what they saw. They begin sp speaking to each other and notice what they say, the gods have become like men. The gods have become like men. This is the only use of this term in the book of Acts. However, it is used in other parts of the Bible. The ideas behind this translation were to resemble something like or to be similar or to be made equal or like something. You can see that in, 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 in the core ideas within this family of terms is the idea of comparison. Comparison. Jesus used it in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, when he compared, when he told the parable of the wheat and the tears, he introduced the parable this way in Matthew 13, verse 24, the kingdom of heaven may be compared, there's our word, to a man who sowed good seed in his field, to be compared to, to be like this. The most important use, however, for us this morning is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. In Hebrews 2, 17, this same word the, that Luke uses here to translate what the Lyconians were saying is used in Hebrews 2 to talk about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, verse 17, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren, this is Jesus, in all things that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. This term could refer to an incarnation, and that's what the Lyconians are saying. The gods have come down to us. They, 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 they're, they're, they're representing themselves in human form, but these two people are actually gods. They identified them as Zeus and Hermes. Now, they refer to... to uh, they refer to Barnabas as Zeus, probably because he was older than, than Paul, but, but also because Paul was the spokesman. Hermes was the spokesman of the gods. He was the messenger of the gods. In fact, I looked it up in, uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it said that Hermes was the, was the god who conducted the dead back in, uh, once they died, that he conducted them in, into Hades. Why is it important? Well, Paul was presenting the gospel. What does the gospel do? Well, it tells you how to avoid death and have life. 
And so they identify Paul as Hermes, the, the spokesman for the gods, and the one declaring how they can have life rather than death. Their false declaration, they identified them as gods. Also, their false adoration, verse 13. And the priest of Zeus, he got in it, he got, in, uh, he got in on it too, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Now, unlike in the myth, these people weren't going to mess up. Remember what happened in the myth. Hermes and Zeus show up. They go door to door and can't find anybody to help them. And this elderly couple helps them, and they get blessed, and everybody else get, gets killed. These people won't go mess up this time. So they, they want to recognize these gods. They want to they offer sacrifice. They want to worship them. The failure of the people in the myth was not going to be their failure. Apparently, someone ran off to inform the, the local priest of what had happened. He immediately made his way into town with oxen, to make a sacrifice. In fact, it says that garlands were, were, he brought garlands as well. They were probably hanging around the oxen's head. What's, what, what's going on here? Well, although Paul and Barnabas didn't speak the language of the, of the natives, remember, they grew, they grew up around these people. They grew, they grew up around a Gentiles. Both Paul and Barnabas were well accustomed to Gentile lifestyle, Gentile living. They knew well how Gentiles were. And they, they could identify immediately these people are getting ready to make sacrifices. Garlands were used in pagan rituals with oxen to make sacrifices. So although they don't understand the language, they clearly can see what's going on. They're, and, and, and they hightail it to the gate. Okay, verses 14 through 18. The response of the missionaries. Having grown, up, having grown up in the context of Gentiles and their worship, Paul and Barnabas immediately jumped to it. Look at what happens here. But the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it. When, the, when they heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed into the crowd, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men in the same... Also, we are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you in order that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in the generations gone by, he permitted the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without a witness, without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from, from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even saying these things, they with difficulty restrained the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. Notice with me three things here in verses 14 through 18. Their earnestness, their exhortation, and their effect. First, their earnestness, verse 14. Their earnestness. Paul and Barnabas immediately knew what was going on. And they ran they ran out into the crowd. Luke here recorded three, a threefold response, each point of which tells the reader that they were earnestly concerned. They heard them, Luke said, and they acted immediately. Notice he said they tore their robes. They tore their robes. Although we see examples of people tearing their outer garments in the Old Testament, the rabbis identified this as the proper response of a Jew when they hear blasphemy. In fact, in Matthew 26, verse 65, the rabbis tear their clothes in hearing what Jesus, what Jesus declared of himself. This was very Jewish. It was very Jewish. And Paul and Barnabas tear their clothes. Not that the Lyconians would have known what they were doing, but this is just a, a Jewish response to blasphemy. They rushed into the crowd, and the text said they were crying out. This word crying out was used of crows croaking. It was a, it was a, it was a rough and, 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 and raucous sound. 
they, they, they were trying everything they could do to get the people's attention. They wanted to bring it to a stop. But there's something going on here that I want you to notice with me, based on how I started the sermon this morning. Why didn't Paul and Barnabas parlay this into, into, uh, into a better hearing from the people? Can you imagine? If these people thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods, they could have told them anything. Don't you think they would have accepted Jesus? I mean, why stop them from doing this? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be better just to, just to accept their worship and then use, use their opinion of them to, to move them towards Jesus? See, this is, this is the temptation of synchronization. Yeah. It's tempting. Accept the positive. Embrace it. And then use it for the gospel. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You should never reduce Christianity to its common denominators, with, with, with common denominator with other systems. Amen. Never. If, if your authority, listen church, if your authority within a group is built on compromise, your authority will never rise above that point of compromise. You, you're not going to gain anything. Paul and Barnabas would not accept this, although if they, if they allowed the crowd to go forward, they would be received like gods. Surely that could benefit Christianity. No, it wouldn't benefit Christianity. We must hold to the issues of the faith no matter what we think will benefit Christianity from our compromise. Our compromise won't benefit Christianity. The faith will not be bettered by you fitting in. Those people that you want to accept you, they will never fully accept you. They will never fully accept your Christianity. There is nothing you can do as far as compromise is concerned that will lead to people embracing the Christian faith. It's not going to happen. Paul and Barnabas would not accept what these people were offering no matter how beneficial it might have been to them. But they don't, they don't just evidence this, earn, this earnestness, they also give an exhortation. Verses 15 through 17. They strongly refused what was going on, trying to get the people to see that there was no link between Christianity and what they were doing. They began in verse 15 with a rhetorical question. Men, why are you doing these things? They wanted them to stop and think. They had got into a frenzied state. They were out of control. And Paul seeks to get them under control. One immediately, is, one immediately sees the emphasis of Luke here in the, in the, in the, in the Greek text here of, of verse 15 we is at the head of the sentence giving extra emphasis to it. We are also men of the same nature as you, same kind as you. We have the same disposition that you have, uh, same nature, he said. Although they had thought that the gods had taken on flesh to come down to them, Paul and Barnabas indicated that they were actually just like them. They were completely human. They were completely human. And so Paul begins to break it down like, haven't you been listening to us? He, he, he begins talking about what he had been declaring to them. If, if, they, if they really believed that they were special, why were they not responding to the message but disagreeing with, with the message in their actions? Paul said, we had been announcing to you the good news. Good news. They had been preaching the gospel. And what did the good news do? The good news told them to turn from certain things. You see, church, this is why, they, this is why Paul and Barnabas couldn't compromise. 
Christianity says abandon the world, right. not embrace it. Right. How are you going to embrace the world to fit in? And Christianity says turn. I mean, embracing the world is, is, is counter everything that's Christianity. And so Paul says, we have been declaring to you the gospel. And what is, and what is the gospel? To turn. To repent. Right? And Paul says, it doesn't make sense. We've been telling you to, to turn from what things? From these vain things. There was, there was, uh, two, there's two Greek words that could, could be translated here. One of them means vain or, or worthless because it doesn't have any content. And one of them means vain or worthless because it's deceptive or ineffective. And, and that's the idea here. That's the word that's used here. These vain things are deceptive. What are the, what are the vain things he's talking about? He's talking about these other gods. They're, they're vain. They're deceptive. They're ineffective. Keep your finger here and turn to, turn to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Listen, listen as the psalmist compares our God to the gods. Our God to the gods. Psalm 115, verse 1 through 8. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory. Why? Because thy loving kindness, because of thy truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of a man's hands. They have mouths, but guess what? They cannot speak. They have eyes, but guess what? They cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot spell, smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. Paul says, we told you to turn from those vain things. Our God is a living God. That's the God of Christianity. That's the God we present in our gospel. He speaks, he sees, he hears, he smells, he feels, he walks, he makes sounds, and he makes decisions. Because he's a living God, we ought to suspect that he's doing living things. Notice, notice what Paul says back in Acts 14, verse 15. Who is this living God? who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. We're telling you to abandon these vain things for the truth. Do you believe that the world is following lies? Do you believe that? Some of us don't act that way. The world is following lies. Almost everything they say is a lie. We have the truth. Amen. And Paul is saying, we, we, we're trying to get you all to abandon the vain things of the world and embrace the truth. And, you, and, and what are you doing? You want to make sacrifices to things that aren't even real. However, the living God of the Christian faith was not just the origin of all that they see and experience. Paul goes one step further. You are alive today because of him. Listen to Paul. N not, not only is he the God that brought everything into existence, but you live today because he has allowed you to live. L look at verse 16. And in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Verse 17. And yet he did not leave himself without a, a witness in that he did good and gave you, you rains from heaven and, and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Look what God did. God, although he created everything, he allowed you to bypass him. <laughs> 
You see, it, it, put yourself in their shoes. They do this, Paul's been preaching the gospel, he's been doing his thing, he does a miracle, they think that he's, that he's God. Paul says, look, the real God who created everything, you're hearing about for the first time in our gospel. The, the natural question is, well, why haven't we heard about this God before? Paul said he allowed you to skip him. But he left you a witness. So all the while you're rejecting God, the real God, the God who created everything, but he left a witness for you. What was the witness? You eating? You, you eating? That was, that was a compassionate play on God's part, on, on your behalf. He, 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 he gave you, he, he didn't leave, he said, I didn't leave himself without a witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God was merciful to you. This word good here means benevolent. God was kind to you. Amen. And the unsaved world needs to hear that. God, God's been kind to you. Benevolent. As I, as I thought about this text, I couldn't help but think of Romans chapter 1. It's, it's like Romans chapter 1, but it's, it's, a, it's a little lighter version of Romans chapter 1. In, in, Romans, in Romans 1, Paul, Paul is basically saying, you're going to hell because you, because you suppress the truth. And he, he, he doesn't quite say that here, but, but it's, it's still just as powerful. You're ignoring God, but God is doing all types of kindness to you. When, when you bring the gospel to somebody else, to other people. Part of that gospel is God has been benefiting you all this while and you don't even know it. He's, he, he's been doing good to you. He's been kind to you. And you ignore him anyway. Part of our gospel appeal is the goodness of God. The kindness of God. Even the people who don't respond to him properly. God is kind anyway. Amen. We thank God for his kindness. Don't we, church? Yeah. We're thankful for his kindness. Yeah. What, he, what he has done for us is good. With much effort, Luke says they barely got these people to stop, verse 18. And even saying these things, they with difficulty restrained the crowds from offering sacrifices to them. Synchronization is a strong pull. Strong pull. I mean, we, we got so much synchronization going on. I mean, what is Oprah but this one big synchronization movement? I mean, Oprah, is, Oprah tries to wed Christianity with every other religion she can come up with. Yeah. It's insane. All, all people want to have Jesus and something else. But Jesus won't be wedded with anything else. It's Jesus all by himself. No compromise. Jesus is the, as I always say, he's the periphery and he's the center of Christianity. He's everything. For, to us. Yes. And we don't synchronize, syncretize with other groups. No. Yes. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Yes. They, finally, they finally stopped these people. And now, uh, you would think the story, the story would kind of end here. The story's done. I mean, they, they, they stopped them. They continued to do their, their ministry and everything went hunky-dory. It doesn't stop here, though. Look at the response of the Jews, verses 19 and 20. But Jews came from Antioch and I, and I, I, I honey him, and having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul. <laughs> this, this is insane. They, they were just getting ready to offer sacrifices to these people as gods. Do you see how fickle people are? 
One day, they think that you're all that. And the next, they want to kill you. Do you see how fickle people are? Don't put your trust in people. People will turn on you in a second. In a second. Look, what, I mean, this is crazy to me. But Jews came from here, and having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he arose and entered the city. And the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. They responded with violence. But their response was ultimately a failure. First, with violence, verse 19. Now, if you read Paul's letters, you find out that Paul was always talking about how the Jews hounded him. Every time he would start a church, they'd go to that church and try to get these Gentiles to be circumcised or whatever. They'd, they'd follow him around and just basically wear him out. You get an idea where this started, Right? These people weren't even in Lystria. They were a couple days' journey away. And they, they packed up their bags. They heard Paul was pre... Let's go get him. What? Don't you got anything better to do? They're, they're, they're tracking Paul down for, in another city. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. I'm not sure how long the, the a team was in the city, but, but a, a, eventually a crew from these other two cities where Paul had problems, find out he's in Lystria. And they make their way to Lystria. And our text says they won over the multitudes. They, they got the multitudes to embrace their false opinion of the Christian faith. Uh, so, sometimes when you're reading this, some people say, well, it doesn't make sense. How, how, this story can't be true. People don't do this. Well, yeah, they do. You remember Paul in Acts 9? What did he do in Acts 9? Paul got a letter from the high priest to go up to Damascus to find Christians in Damascus and to bring them back bound to Jerusalem. You don't think Jews do this? All day long. All day long. They wanted to snub out Christianity. It's no wonder Paul wrote in Romans 10 verse 2, he said this, for I bear them, Jews, witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They're, they're zealous. They'll track you down to another city if they got to. But their, but their zeal is not tied to knowledge, the truth. What they tried to have done in Iconium they had done here. They stoned Paul. The deliberate stoning of the apostles seems to indicate that, that this was a, a proper civil act. So apparently they got the multitudes and some government officials to sanction this act. And they killed Paul. At least they thought they killed him. But it was a failure, verse 20 says. After they drug him out of the city and left him there as dead for his comrades to bury him, the Bible says in verse 20, <clears throat> but while the disciples stood around him, he arose and entered the city, and the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. While the believers were standing around, possibly shocked and disheartened, he arose. Surprisingly, he did not leave immediately, however, but he went back to the city, stayed a day, and then went to Derby. Let's quickly end with Derby. I just got a couple of words, words to say here. Derby, that's verse, the end of verse 20 to verse 21. It's, uh, Derby was approximately 30 miles away to the southeast. It would have been a two-day journey. The, the, the journey was fruitful. Look at the beginning of verse 21. And after they had preached the gospel in that, to that city and had made many disciples. This is a, a short account what took place in Derby, but it's noteworthy because many people came to the Lord in that city. Do you see how, although Satan wanted to stop the ministry, God would use the ministry to accomplish his will. S Satan can't defeat the church, y'all. Try as he might. 
Try as he might. They stoned Paul in hopes that he would be done. But God said, oh, he's just getting ramped up. And they go to Derby and have a massive influx of, of, of people, probably more than at, 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 uh, at Lystria. Paul would go to Derby. Paul and Barnes would go to Derby, and that would be the last city, and that would close out their first journey, which we will look at. We'll look at the close of it next, next time. But as we think about this, this account, I just want to reaffirm to you, church, the importance of not... not compromising with the world, not synchronizing with other religions. There's no benefit in that for us. We stand alone as Christians, and we call to a world that has rejected God, that God has not rejected you. He's given you food. He's given you fruitful seasons. You need to repent and turn to him. You may have thought that you were just benefiting from your hard labor or the hard labor of your parents, but let me tell you something. God was providing for you. And rather than living your life for you, you should be living your life for the Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks this, this day for this important story for us. As we think about our own lives, Lord God, we recognize that we're not always doing what we should be doing. We pray that you would help us, Lord God, to live a distinctively Christian life, to not synchronize with the world. Help us to be passionate about Christ and his will. I pray for those in the, under the sound of my voice who have not committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that today they would do that. God has done so many good things for them. I pray that they would see their need to turn their lives, to turn to Christ. Pray for us as believers. Help us, Lord God, to be conduits of your, of your message to the world. Guide us in this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I'd ask you to keep the moving to a minimum as we ready ourselves for the Lord's table this morning.